Thank you for joining this uh, virtual Sunday School class. It is the first virtual Sunday School class for our adult summer Sunday School. We just have one Sunday School. This summer we're doing something a little different. We are going to look at the one another passages that are in the New Testament. And I'm starting the first class today and we're going to look at the uh, one another passage where we are told that we are to love one another. And then each week there will be a different elder that will uh, select one of the many one another passages that we find in the New Testament. So I hope that this class will be a encouragement and, um, and will spur you on to encourage one another in love and good deeds. Also, some of you may have picked up that uh, little booklet that I had that I forgot to bring with me today. But uh, this little booklet, little booklet, Caring for One Another, um, it's, it's not a, the text for the class. The text for the class will be the New Testament, but it is a reference book. And I encourage you to read through that book. It's got some good questions on specific ways that uh, you and we as a church can work at caring for one another. And, of course, at the basis of caring for one another is having a love and a concern for, for each other. But let me just pray for us today. Father, we thank you that we're together, and we do pray that you would bless this summer class of looking at the one another passages in the New Testament. Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher today and for your blessing to be upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was coming into the church this past week one morning, I was listening to a sermon, and the uh, sermon was on the topic of loneliness. And the uh, preacher of the sermon, the speaker, was just making the point that uh, God works through loneliness, and he uses loneliness to enable us to come to experience him and know him in ways we never would have been able to unless we had been through that period or those times of loneliness, and uh, he, had, he had made some quotes, brought some quotes out in that sermon, or in that sermon. and uh, one of them I thought was interesting was by, was by Albert Einstein, and Albert Einstein said this, he said, it is strange to be known so universally and yet to be so lonely, um, and I just thought that was interesting, a person of that stature, of that importance, uh, as brilliant as he was, as, as knowledgeable as he was, as many people who knew him, yet he was so aware of his own loneliness. Um, also came across a survey, uh, 48,000 college students were surveyed, and 64% of them reported feeling extremely lonely in the, last, in the past year that this study had been done. Um, and, and again, I just thought that that, that was so interesting, uh, just how there is this universal experience of loneliness that people feel. And, and so we have that reality, and, and of course you can do more research and find that even though we're as connected as we are today because of social media, yet it seems as though the more connectivity that we have and the more connectedness that exists, particularly among some particular age groups, there's a greater sense of loneliness. And so, so as I just thought about that and some of those statistics and then thought about what the Bible tells us about these one another passages, it just reminded me of the fact that we are made for relationship. We're made for a relationship with God and we are made for a relationship and relationships with others. Remember in Genesis chapters one, two, and three, God created Adam and Eve. When he created Adam, he said, it's not good for Adam to be alone, and I'll make a, a, a helpmate suitable for him. And he made uh, Eve as his wife, and the two were to be one. Um, and, and there again, it just is a reminder that we are made for community, that we are made in God's image. We are image bearers, and because we are image bearers and made uh, in the image of God, in the Godhead, there's a perfect community, there's perfect oneness, there's perfect fellowship. And so we have within us this desire to be in relationship with other people. And we are made, we are created to bring a blessing uh, and to be blessed. That there is to be this mutual experience, uh, one to another, that uh, we're to be loving one another. And you just look at these uh, one another passages in the Bible, and I have the sheet that will be available for a download, but on the sheet there are 59 one another's of the New Testament. Uh, 
uh, love, love one another, you can find that passage uh, repeated, I believe, some 15 times I counted on, on this particular sheet. And, of course, loving one another is the foundation of any other one another passage in the New Testament. But uh, you also have uh, Romans 12.10. It says, honor one another. Or Romans 14.13, stop passing judgment on one another. Or Romans 15.7, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you. Or 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Paul writes there, have equal concern for one another. Galatians 5, 13. Serve one another in love. Or Ephesians 4, 2. Be patient, bearing one, with one another in love. Or Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. So you can see... There are just numerous <coughs> one another passages that are in the New Testament. So we are made for a relationship with God, and we are made for a relationship with one another, and in our relationships with one another, we have a responsibility, we have a duty. Uh, we, we have the commandments, we have the teachings of Christ. Uh, we are to... Um, love each other and we're to build up one another and encourage one another. So all these various ways that God shows us in his word, um, we are to carry out these reciprocal relationships or these reciprocal responsibilities one to another. And so today uh, I'd like to look at the, the one that I believe is key and the foundation of every other one, and that is that we're to love one another. Uh, Francis Schaeffer wrote a little, a little book entitled The Mark of a Christian, and he writes this. He says, the mark that Jesus gives to label a Christian not just in one era or in one locality, but at all times and in all places until Jesus returns, and that one mark is the mark of love. That is to always mark us as a Christian. And you think about that, that that one mark, we're to have that attitude, we're to always evidence that behavior in every single thing that you and I do. You know, imagine if before we ever uttered a word to another person, we always asked ourselves the question, am I, going, am I saying this in love? Uh, do I have this person's best interests in, in mind? Or before we do any action, or before we hit the send button, on that keyboard to an email or before we, we text that text message and, and, and send it, we ask ourselves the question, is what I'm writing, is what I'm about to send, is it from a heart of love? Is it from an attitude of love? Is, it, is this what Jesus would have me say and communicate to another person or this action that I'm about to take, is it really an action out of love? Um, that, that's what we want to think about, and love is what must always govern and control us. Um, and, and, you know, you think about love, as I mentioned before, uh, of the one another passages in the New Testament, it's mentioned 15 times. Um, and, and in a couple of those instances, in 1 Peter 3, 8, it says that we're to love one another deeply from the heart. So it really shows how love is to be so deep into our hearts and is to be expressed from the very core of our being that, that in the deepest recesses of our heart and our thinking that we have this kind of an attitude towards another person. Or Galatians 5.13 says that we're to serve one another in, in love. So in everything that, that we do, it is always done from this foundation of a loving heart, a caring heart. First, because... We, we love God and we do it in, in the glory, glory to God, but that we also are marked by love for this particular person or for those people. Um, and as the passage that, that I do want to read here, um, just to start off from, is John 13, verses 31 to 35. We see Jesus uh, telling us that he has a new commandment for us. And so uh, let me just read that, John chapter 13, verses 31 to 35, and it says this, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while and I'm with you. You will seek me 
And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So a very interesting passage. It's in the context of the last week of Jesus' life as uh, John spends uh, the next number of chapters, beginning at chapter 13, uh, giving us uh, a narrative, telling the story of what went on that week leading up to uh, Jesus being betrayed by Judas, being handed over uh, to the trial, and then going to the cross and dying for our sins and rising again from the dead. And so here he tells his disciples he has this new commandment that he gives to them, that they are to love one another just as he loved them, and he says that he lays down his life for, for them. So as we just think about this teaching that we have that is so integral and foundational to every other one another commandment and is, at, and is really at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, we need to understand God's love, God's love for us, and, and how we get that love in us. Because it's only by getting, by understanding God's love that he has for us and, and getting that love in our hearts and appropriating it will we, will we then be able to love other people the way that the Bible tells us to. So, so first of all, um, if I'm going to love the way I need to love, and, and I'm always learning it, you and I are always learning it, we first need to know something of God's love for us. And, and so just as Jesus says here, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. But that, that phrase, just as I have loved you. Um, in the Systematic Theology book, uh, Reformed Systematic Theology, Revelation in God by Joel Beakey and Paul Smalley, um, in talking about the attributes of God, um, they talk about God's love. And in, so you think about God's attributes, uh, God's characteristics, that's, that's another meaning for the word attribute, but God's characteristics or the ways that God is defined or can be known, he has these characteristics, these uh, qualities that, that mark him. And there are qualities that mark God that we do not share in, in any way whatsoever. Uh, God is, is independent. He, he doesn't need anything. Um, that's, that's one of God's incommunicable attributes we talk about. Um, God is, is all-knowing. Uh, he knows everything. There's nothing that God does not know. Uh, our knowledge is very limited. And then, then there are attributes that God has that, that we share in, such as God's holiness. You know, God is holy, but, but we're also able to be holy. Or God is love, and, and we're also uh, able to love. Or God is patient, and we're also able to be patient. Um, so, so they talk about God's, revelate, God's attributes, and they use a couple of important verses I'd like to read. The first one is Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. So if you turn your Bibles to that, um, Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. Notice what he says here. Moses is, is speaking. Um, it says, The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the children's children to the third and fourth generations. But just, you know, think, think about these qualities that um, is being talked about here that Moses has recorded for us, that um, the Lord, he's merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding, uh, in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love uh, for thousands. So you have that, that reference. Also in Exodus 34, 14, 
Uh, look at what it says there. For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And so it, as they write about these attributes of God, um, they make the point that these attributes are God's moral qualities. Um, they, they talk about that, um, that it's his, it's his lordship and his love or his majesty and his moral excellence. So God's attributes are his moral excellence, how great God is. And God's moral excellence is in his steadfast love, in his mercy, uh, and they can be summarized by God's goodness, that God is a good God. Um, and, and so as you just think about that aspect of God, who, who God is in his essence, that the Bible tells us that God is love, he's a glorious God, but that God is a God of great, great love, great, great compassion and mercy and kindness to his people. And, and so, as, so as we think about that, um, you think about what Satan is always seeking to bring before your face. What Satan is always seeking to tempt you with. That Satan is always wanting you to question God's goodness for you. He wants you more than anything to doubt his love. If you're like me, and I know you are, you struggle in, in believing God loves you. you. You always need to be reminded. You always need to be brought back to that. Satan, Satan is always tempting you and, and getting you to entertain the idea and to dwell upon the fact and, and to set you off in a downward spiral questioning the goodness and the love of God for you. Um, and so we see that back in Genesis cha chapter 3. It, it is the repeated temptation that Satan is always tempting his church and his people with. And we see it first with, with uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis cha chapter 3. So you notice in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So, so there you have this temptation. And, and if you think about your own thinking and, and the ways that Satan tempts you, 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 you will see that, that this is always his mode of attack for you, for the people around you, for me is that he, Satan wants us to question and to doubt and to not believe that God is a God who's good, that God is a God who is love. He wants us, that's the lie that he always brings a, a, before us. Now he attacks the authority of, of God's word in, in this passage. Uh, that, that's also at, evident, um, but it, it's an attack going back to the writers of the systematic theology, on God's morality. It's an attack on God's moral goodness. Satan was attacking God's love on that day with Adam and Eve in, in the garden to question not, not just the authority of God's word, just not, not what God had said would be the consequences, but to question that God was good. Romans 125 reminds us that... Um, the unbeliever exchanged the, exchanges the truth of God for a lie. Uh, God had given Adam and Eve the entire cosmos to enjoy. They had everything. And God gave one positive law. And by Adam and Eve passing by that tree, not entertaining any thought of disobeying God, they were honoring God, they were demonstrating to God that they loved God. They, they in a sense, there was a reciprocation that was going on. Uh, in their relationship with God. But when Adam and Eve embraced that thought and, and took the bait and gave into the temptation that God was a God who wasn't benevolent, who wasn't good, that God was a God who was withholding joy and fulfillment and happiness uh, from them, they 
took matters in, into their own hands, they gave in to the temptation, and um, there's been problems ever since. But that, that is the temptation that's always going to come to us, is the temptation that, that God isn't good, that, that God isn't loving, that God doesn't care about us. And that's something that we're always going to fight against in our lives. Uh, one book I was reading, Sinclair Ferguson on the whole Christ, he, um, he says this about that passage. Um, he writes, thus the lie was an assault on both God's generosity and his integrity. Neither his character nor his words were to be trusted. This, in fact, is the lie that sinners have believed ever since. That's always the struggle that, that you and I have. It's so easy for us to, to embrace the idea that, that God doesn't really care for us, that God doesn't love us. Uh, so that's always the fight, is we always have to come back to the reality that God is a God who loves us, who cares for us. We can't give in to the temptation that he's not good. Uh, we need to always come back to the reality of what God has done for us in and through the cross. So, so notice back to the chapter in John chapter 13. So what does Jesus say? He says that we're to love one another, right? Um, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And so what, what is it that Jesus did to show us the love that he has for us? And what Jesus did for us and what he's telling his disciples here is that he was going to the cross. Jesus gave his life for our sins. Uh, Jesus demonstrated uh, his love for us. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. And, and there's nothing that you, you or I could ever do to ever earn God's love for us, to ever earn God's acceptance, God's concern or care for us, there's nothing we could ever do to earn God's blessing. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson, he uh, says this. He says, the Father does not love us because we are sinners, but he does love us even though we are sinners. He loved us before Christ died for us. It is because he loves us that Christ died for us. So we can never think that there's anything we ever have to do in order for God to love us. That God loves us because he loves us. He loves us because he chose to love us. Why? I don't know. But it's only because of his love. Nothing that he sees in that. And so that truth, that, that God so loved you, that God so loved me, is the truth that we always have to come back to and believe over and over again. And it's that truth that has to be what, what motivates us and drives us to love other people the way the Bible tells us that, that we're to do that. Um, so that's the first thing. And, and, and that's the first thing. It's the now thing. And it's always going to be the truth that we have to keep coming back to. Uh, but then the second thing that I think to notice here in this passage is that um, we need to appropriate this. We, we need to be able to really understand it and believe it so that it operates in our lives, so that we have the power in our lives to love people. Because you and I know that it can be a real challenge to love people. People can be very difficult, um, in or, very, very difficult to love. So it's something that we always ha have to work at. So how can we do this? What is it? That, that we can do. Well, in Jerry Bridges, in his book, The Transforming Power of the Gospel, he has a chapter in that book entitled, A Daily Embrace of the Gospel. And maybe you've heard this before, this idea of we need to be preaching the gospel to ourselves. That's kind of a popular a language that, that's used. Um, but there is this need for you and I daily to embrace the gospel, to, em to believe every day in the gospel. And, and the gospel is what God has done for me that I couldn't do for myself, that, that God loves me more than I'll ever be able to understand this side of heaven. I'm more sinful than I'll ever be able to understand the side of heaven. But in spite of how sinful I am 
God still loves me more than I'll ever be able to take in. So there's this need for you and I every day to daily embrace the gospel. Um, Paul in Galatians 2.20, he says this, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So there you can see Paul himself recognized that every day he needed to, to embrace the gospel. Every day he needed to go back. He needed to be reminded of the love that God had for him. Also in Romans chapter 5, um, verse 1 it, it is another important verse. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of understanding that justification, uh, Paul says that a Christian is able to not only go through tribulation, but he's able to rejoice in tribulation, and that tribulation produces thankfulness, endurance, and character, and hope, and hope does not disappoint, because again, the love of God has been poured out into our hearts uh, through the Holy Spirit. So, so again, coming back to the gospel, coming back to the reminder of how much God loves us is, is what drives us to love other people. Um, Jerry Bridges, in his book on, daily, on the need to daily embrace the gospel, he quotes Richard Lovelace. I've used this quote before. It, it certainly is a good quote to be heard again. But uh, Richard Lovelace, in his book, Spiritual Dynamics, which is a, which is a, a, a very good book on uh, how, how to appropriate and understand the Holy Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. But he, quotes, he says this, only a fraction of the professing body, of profess, uh, only a fraction body of professing Christians are solidly appropriating the justifying work of Christ in their lives. Many have so light an apprehension of God's holiness and the extent and guilt of their sin that they consciously, that consciously they see little need for justification, although below the surface of their lives they are deeply guilt-ridden and insecure. Many others have a theor theoretical commitment to this doctrine, but in their day-to-day -day existence, they rely on their sanctification for their justification, drawing their assurance of acceptance with God from their sincerity, their past experience of conversion, their recent religious performance, or the relative infrequency of their conscious, conscious willful disobedience. So Lovelace is making... The point here, you know, the observation, which, which, which he's right, and, and maybe you would, you would agree with it if you just look at, as you look into your own life, that we often can base our acceptance by God, from God, based on how we live rather than the fact that we've been justified freely as an act of God's free grace. And we measure our relationship with God based on our performance rather than who we are in Christ and what Christ has done for us. Again, what Jesus says, disciples, says to his disciples, that we are to love one another just as he has loved us and he showed us his love in going to the cross to do something for us once and for all that we could never do for ourselves. And that comes to us through faith in him alone that through faith in him alone, we're justified, forgiven, we realize his love, we continue to realize his love, and that forms the basis of how we love other people. And so Richard Lovelace is just making this point that we need to have a deeper understanding of what the gospel is, of what God has done for us in Christ, of the love of God that has been displayed on the cross of Jesus Christ. Um, also, Lovelace makes the point, in, or rather, um, uh, he makes the point in his book, Jerry Bridges' Transforming Grace, that we fight against this. And, and our battle, uh, we, we fight against our flesh, you know, our own sinfulness. Uh, either, you know, we just, we, the gospel gets clouded out in our lives. We give, we give our, our we, we give in to sin, uh, or we give in to the push and pull of the world, or we're fighting against the evil one, against Satan. Those are the areas where we're always fighting. The flesh, the world, the devil. And uh, one, one comment that um, he makes in his book um, is that since the activity of Satan is one of the most important roadblocks a Christian encounters in his, 
encounters in his efforts to serve God, the existence and device of fallen angels should be adequately understood by every serious church member. Uh, he writes of dem demonic harassment. You know, spiritual warfare, Satan is always going to be tempting us, discouraging us. He's the enemy of our souls uh, in ways worse than we probably realize. But that's always a reality that we need to be aware of. And so you and I always have this need to, to embrace the gospel day by day, to always come back to the centrality of Jesus and what he has done for us on, on the cross. Uh, Lovelace continues in his book, he says, few Christians know enough to start each day with the thoroughgoing stand upon Martin Luther's platform. You're accepted, looking outward in faith and claiming the holy external righteousness of Christ, the only ground of acceptance, relaxing in that quality of truth which will produce increasing sanctification and transformation as faith is active in love and gratitude. So every day in this fresh embrace of the gospel or by preaching the gospel to ourselves or going back to our acceptance in Christ, our justification in Christ, even our election in Christ or our regeneration in Christ, the sovereign work of God on our behalf, that as we go back and think about that gospel, um, we, we are re, we're embracing the gospel again. We're, we're taking these truths back into our hearts. Our hearts, our minds are being moved in our souls as we are reminded of how much God loves us, of how accepted we are, and that, just as Paul says at the end of, end of Romans chapter 8, that there is nothing that we could ever do, there is nothing that could ever happen to us in the seen world or the unseen world that could ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so as you begin to really penetrate this truth, you can see why Paul is always talking about God's love. Um, Romans chapter 5, as I referred to before, but also as you think about his prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. Turn over to that with me. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, uh, Paul's prayer at the end of that chapter, which which is a great prayer, but look at his emphasis on God's love. Now, consider that in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, he says, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself. So the very foundation of your salvation, my salvation in eternity, is God chose us in love. So he returns to that at the end of chapter 3 in this prayer, where he prays for the church, and he prays that the church, you and I, would be strengthened, that God would grant us to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner being, the inner man, the inner woman, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So, so look at, look what he does. Look at how love is so important. Look at how we need the work of the Holy Spirit to help us have a greater understanding of how loved you and I are by Christ and by God, how accepted we are by Christ and, and, and by God, that, that God has a purpose for our lives, that God is working our lives, that, that even through the suffering and the, and the hardships uh, and the disappointments in our lives, that, that God is using all of that, that, there, that there's nothing that God is ever doing in our lives, in our, in our lives, that, that is without him loving us. He's always loving us, and he's always purposing everything uh, for good because of the love that he has for us. And so we need to be reminded of this truth. I uh, think the Psalms are a great place as you see how the psalmist is always going back to the gospel, going back to God's faithfulness. Um, again and again, Psalm 103 is a good psalm. Also, uh, Psalm 73 is another good psalm. Um, psalm 73, in fact, he is very discouraged at what he sees around him. But then he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, uh, that changed everything. 
when he began to dwell once again on the gospel. So as Jesus says here in John 13 that we're to love one another, but we're to love one another because of the love that he's loved us with, and he showed us that love by going to the cross and dying for our sins. And so you and I, every day, we just need to have a fresh embrace of the gospel. And, and that's why we need to be in God's word every day, need to be praying every day. Uh, we need other people in our lives to encourage us to that very end. But we see Jesus teaching that here in John chapter 13. And then the last thing here, that love, love requires you and I uh, to be very specific in, in our lives and, and how we apply it. Um, again, just encourage you to uh, think about uh, uh, John chapter 13, those verses 31 to, uh, to 35. Uh, also, uh, verses in the New Testament, you have 1 John 2, verses 7 through 11. Uh, 1 John 3, verses 11 through 18. 1 John 4, verses 4 through 21. Uh, 1 John 5, verses 1 through 5. Those, those five different passages, John further delves into uh, how important it is that we understand God's love, but how vital it is for us to be loving the people that God puts in our lives. In fact, John goes so far to say that if you and I do not love our brother, we cannot say that we are born again, that we are saved. Because he says, a person who is born of God loves so that is how integral loving one another and loving the difficult people in your life is to being a Christian. That if, if, if you are not loving, the Bible tells us, if I'm not loving, the Bible tells you and I, we cannot say that we are born again Christians because those who are born again love um, so, so we need to be very specific ab about this love. You know, for, first of all, um, we need to realize that, that, that love just has to mark us, just as Francis Schaeffer said in his book. Love has to mark us, and, and as we deal with people out in our lives every day, the, the person at, at the cash register, uh, the person at the gas station, over at Walmart or Target or the people we work with or the, the neighbors, uh, no matter who they are, no matter what their background may be, no matter what the color of their skin may be, that we love. We, we are just a loving people because we have understood how much God loves us and that we are an image bearer. And the people that we interact with are image bearers as well and they are precious and they have value in God's sight. And so that just in a very general way has to mark us as, as Christian people. You know, also, um, we need to love one another. Uh, Romans 13, 8 says, Oh, no one but to love. Um, and we start with the people in our, in our own household. You know, a, a man is to love his wife. Jesus says that a man is to love his wife as Christ loved, loved the church, and Jesus gave his life for the church. And so, so a husband is to love his wife to the point, to the extent, where he would be willing to lay down his life for her. So, so if Jesus is calling a husband to give his life, something as great and drastic as that, then most certainly in the daily things throughout life uh, we're to be selfless in how we treat our wives. And, it, and isn't it not true that the greatest example, the greatest thing a man, a husband can do, a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Um, and so we need to begin with the people in our families. And sometimes that can be the greatest challenge. But as we think about the people in our families and the people that we live with, the person that we're married to, um, we need to ask ourselves, am I selfless? Am I modeling the love of Christ in a way that God would have me to? You know, also in Galatians chapter 6 um, is, is an interesting verse where you'll, you'll notice here in this verse, the Apostle Paul is talking and he says here, uh, let me find it. He says, let us, verse 10, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. So there's just the general principle, because we know we're loved by God, we're to treat people with respect and honor. But notice that in a very special way, 
we are to love those who are of the household of faith. Um, and, and again, that, that, that can be a real challenge. So, sometimes it's not easy being in the church. Uh, sometimes it's not easy being in relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But here the Bible tells us, and you know, Jesus very clearly says to us, and you know, Paul teaches in his word, that uh, we're to love one another and that we are particularly, especially, to love the household of faith. Um, so these are very kind of broad strokes um, as we think about what it means to love one another. And so this Sunday school class will give more specificity as uh, we see particular ways that we are commanded by God to love one another, that we're to forgive each other, um, that we are to be patient and compassionate to one another, that uh, we're to show love by being in submission, being humble uh, before one another, that, that we're to show, one another, show love to one another by carrying one another's burdens, um, by even admonishing one another. We're to teach one another. Um, we're to counsel with one another. We're to be hospitable with one another. We're to spur one another on to love and good deeds. We're not to slander one another. So we're going to see through the coming weeks all the many specific ways that we're to carry out this broad commandment of loving God and loving one another because of the way that Jesus has loved us. So I, I, I hope that um, this class will be an encouragement to you and that the Lord will use it in all of our lives to help us as a church to care for one another. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, your love for us. We thank you for loving us in your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we just ask that you would help us to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen.